Welcome everyone. We'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. Let us reflect on the land upon which we reside. We are coming from many places and we want to acknowledge the ancestral homelands and traditional territories of the indigenous peoples who have been here since time immemorial and to recognize that we must continue to build our solidarity and kinship with native peoples across the Americas and across the globe. San Diego Mesa College is built on the ancestral homelands of the Kumeyaay people, and we acknowledge and honor their tremendous contributions to our region and thank them for their stewardship, past, present, and future. Please join me in a collective breath. As all of our liberation is tied together, so is our history. We also acknowledge that this country was built up from the free enslaved labor of black people, and we honor the legacy of the African diaspora. We honor the legacy of black life, knowledge, and skills stolen due to violence and white supremacy. With this acknowledgement, we recognize a duty to give honor through our work and continue to stand up for racial and social justice every day. We also recognize the tragic aggression occurring in Ukraine with Russia invading their independent historical homeland, and we stand in solidarity with the brave people of Ukraine and with all those affected. Please join me in a moment of silence as we hold Ukraine in our hearts and minds. Thank you. And thank you everyone for coming. My name is Wendy Smith and I am one of the facilitators for today's event, which is being recorded to share with those who are unable to attend. Please fill out our survey. The link is in the chat. This helps us learn more about our audience and improve what we do. Our ethnographer speaker series continues through next week. Monday, we feature Noel Lopez, a National Park Service ethnographer and anthropologist. This series began when I was researching ways to teach English that are immediately relevant to students' lives and careers that would take advantage of their lived experience, observational powers, and diverse perspectives, because, as we know, students bring a lot to the table. My inspirational co-creator, Caitlin Choi, suggested that I include an ethnographer visit, so I started contacting researchers to talk to my students, and before we knew it, we had a whole series. Today, we are excited to present our speaker, Mesa College Anthropology Professor, Dr. Jennifer Syme. Welcome, Jenny. Shall we get started? All right, thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? All right, great. Um, so I'll be sharing um, a slideshow in a moment. Um, first, let me just thank um, Wendy Smith and Caitlin Choi for inviting me to speak today. And I'd especially like to thank all the um, students uh, for being here, um, Wendy's students, and I think some students might be here um, from my own classes and any other friends and colleagues um, who have come. So thank you. Um, Wendy and Caitlin have asked me to um, talk a bit about my education and how I became drawn to anthropology, a little bit of the work I've done, and also my relationship um, to writing. So a fair, a fair amount of things. So I'm gonna spend a bit of time telling um, some of my, my own story um, and how I came to be a cultural anthropologist and carry out field work in Galicia in Northwestern Spain. Um, and it, it's hard for me to believe, but um, for close to um, 20 years now. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you. All right, um, so here's a bit of my uh, contact information, my email in case anybody wants to contact me with um, more questions afterward. Um, I first I just want to show you um, show you a map um, so I can so we can situate ourselves so um, Galicia is in northwestern um, Spain just north of, um, of Portugal here and I was in a city called um, Santiago de Compostela and this is a picture of me um, during my field work on the on the right hand side in 
Santiago de Compostela in a um, what counts as a as a beautiful spring day in that city. It's um, very gray and rainy and lush um, and beautiful. Um, so one of the things that I want to get across today is that figuring out what I wanted to study was not a very linear or straightforward process. Um, I took a lot of detours and I went down a, a number of different paths, um, all of which ended up shaping the kind of work I do today. Um, so I want to talk a bit about that. And I really hope to encourage students who haven't quite figured things out yet that it's normal and to be expected. I meet a lot of students in my classes, whether they're 18 or 20 or 22 or 24. And a lot of people worry that, you know, they're supposed to have this kind of very straightforward vision that they go through steps A, B, C, and D, and they end up in a particular place. Um, and it doesn't always work out like that. And, and, that, and that is more than okay. So um, I wanna show you a little bit about how that worked out for me. Um, so um, I know that in Wendy's class, students are doing some ethnography. So I'm gonna be talking a bit about that as well. Um, and like many cultural anthropologists, I use that term ethnography to refer both to the process of carrying out field work and the process of writing about that field work when we analyze and interpret and relate the stories of the people we work with in, in the field. Um, so fieldwork in cultural anthropology is a really long and intense process. During graduate school, we spend um, a minimum of a year in the field, um, and often, often two. And the field, when I use that term, I mean that it's a place where we want to carry out research amongst a particular group of people. And we do so through a process of intense cultural um, immersion. Um, many anthropologists like myself, we go back to the place where we originally did field work time and again. Um, and so I continue to do field work in Spain. And we also, during this process, we do a lot of writing. Um, we, jot, we do everything from jotting down like shorthand notes to writing up narrative descriptions and to write, um, writing up eth ethnographic articles and books. So in, again, interpretations and analysis. Uh, so I first heard about um, anthropology when I was 16 in my, um, my beautiful public high school in Sacramento, Mira Loma High School, the Mira Loma Matadors, there's our little insignia there. Um, and this was just deep in the, deep in the, the very nondescript suburbs of Sacramento where I went to um, high school. And the world history teacher, who's pictured there in the middle, she actually had a master's degree of anthropology in anthropology, and they let her teach a class. Um, and she was really a pivotal person for me. I think that I loved her as much as I love the class. She was really sarcastic and funny, and she talked to us like adults, even, you know, we were just teenagers, and she was never condescending, and she pushed us really hard. Um, and the material, I don't remember a lot about the specifics that we were reading, but I do remember this basic idea in anthropology um, that the, and this sounds a little bit heady, but um, to me it's fascinating that the fabric of reality itself is a human made thing and that it can be different and it is different in different places in different cultures. Um, so for me, that was an incredibly exhilarating and freeing kind of realization. Um, so at the same, same time that I was in high school learning about anthropology, I was also honing my childhood love of, of writing, especially poetry. And I took a creative writing class and I wrote poetry and I co-edited my high school's literary magazine. And that's a picture of me on the right from my senior year of high school. Um, posing like I'm editing a, 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 a paper. And of course the year is 1994. So I have the requisite like flannel shirt on and all of that stuff. Um, so, but, so it sounds like I'm going in a particular direction. Yes, found my love of anthropology early and went in that direction, but, but no. Um, so I was, I still am the daughter of um, two chemistry professors. Um, my older sister had majored in chemistry at UC Berkeley. 
And I personally had wanted to be um, a doctor since I was like fourth grade. And I think this was in part because of the science orientation of my family. Like I just was kind of maybe even just inadvertently pushed in that direction. But part of it also had to do with my own family history. Um, I was really intrigued with the story of my, my mother's um, parents, my maternal grandparents. Um, they were both doctors and they were also refugees from Nazi Germany who immigrated to the US um, in the 30s when the Nazi government passed laws saying that Jewish doctors could not um, practice medicine on, on non-Jewish um, patients. So they left relatively early on. And I learned from the time that I was quite small that my own personal history, the history of my family was bound up with this European history of fascism. And I think this, this would end up being kind of uh, something really pivotal um, for, for me in shaping the kinds of things I wanted to do later on. So um, I had, let's see here. I had really um, wanted to go to um, Berkeley from the time um, I was a kid. Um, and I think maybe just because it was so different from Sacramento in part, I knew it was a good school. So that was part of it. But I had this very romantic vision of Berkeley about like, maybe less about the campus, as we see here on the left, the campus, but more about Telegraph Avenue, as we can see on the right-hand picture. I wanted to like wander around Telegraph Avenue with like the punks and the hippies and wear tie-dye and hang out in coffee shops and secondhand bookstores and breathe in the incense and the secondhand pot smoke and, and have this life where I would, I would figure out who who I was, and I, I imagined, right, that Berkeley would be this place where it would happen. And um, luckily, I was I was admitted um, to to Berkeley, and so I set about doing my pre med classes, um, calculus and chemistry, um, and also gen and also gen ed, which were really important. So um, anthropology for my social sciences requirement, and religious studies for my humanities requirement. And by the end of the first semester of my second year of college, I was done with pre-med. I remember sitting in a huge lecture hall in my um, organic chemistry class and looking around at the other 400, and I'm not exaggerating, 400 other students in that lecture hall, most of whom were pre-med and just thinking, the world does not need me to be a doctor. It has all these other people. I'm gonna do something else. And I ended up double majoring in anthropology and, and religious studies. Um, I was still actually interested in medicine. So I was drawn to medical anthropology, um, which I also, I teach a class here in medical anthropology at Mesa. Um, and this is the study of social and cultural forces that shape the experiences of health, illness, and healing. And I was doing something totally different in religious studies. I was interested in mysticism, medieval Europe, end of wor world fantasies in Judaism 2000 years ago, kind of esoteric stuff. Um, and I kept on doing some writing, took creative writing classes. Um, and then something, um, something else rather pivotal um, happened. So um, toward the end of my sophomore year of college, um, I suffered from um, a traumatic event that left me with really severe um, anxiety and, um, and depression. And I ended up, um, I think, only completing one class um, that semester. Um, I withdrew from another and I took incompletes in everything else. And this isn't something that I talk about um, publicly um, very much at all, but I'm also wanting to kind of take this occasion to put that out there because um, I know so many students who have issues with anxiety and depression and often they think that they're the only person and that is going to, if they take time off from school, that it's gonna ruin their, their, their lives. Um, and I thought it might be helpful in some way just to kind of put out a little bit about um, what I experienced. Um, so uh, my recovery process was, was kind of slow, um, but I decided eventually that I wanted to write a senior honors 
thesis on mental illness um, from an anthropological um, perspective. Um, and I think in part because I just, I wanted to understand um, in a deeper way, my own experience, which was very isolating and um, well, there was a lot of stigma around it. Um, I did not wanna do it on people in exactly my, uh, do a, the field work on people in exactly my situation. I think that I felt that would be too close to home. I wasn't ready to do that. Um, so I decided to do ethnographic field work um, with people my own age who suffered with from bipolar disorder and who had been hospitalized in the wake of either a manic or depressive episode. And I wanted to know how this um, experience of hospitalization, the experience of diagnosis, the experience of taking psychiatric medication long-term, how all of this would shape that what we call in anthropology, someone's subjectivity or their sense of self, their sense of, of personhood. Um, so I continued to be interested in these sorts of issues, but when I graduated from college, I got a chance to go to Spain with a PhD student in anthropology at Berkeley um, who wanted to lead a small group of anthropology and religious studies students along a pilgrimage route called the Camino de Santiago, the way of St. James. And we ended up walking 500 miles from the French border to Santiago de Compostela, which I showed you all before. I knew no Spanish, I knew nothing about Spain, um, but I wanted to go because I wanted to have an adventure. I wanted it because it fit with my academic interests and I went and it was this life-changing experience of doing nothing but walking every day for miles through all these different landscapes, pushing my body to the limit and then forming these really intense experiences relationships with other people um, walking to um, Santiago. And I decided um, that I wanted to go back to um, Spain to do, to do research in graduate school. Um, so I worked for a year after I got back from Spain. Um, I worked in the foster care system. I worked in an independent bookstore. I applied to graduate school and like many people who apply to graduate school, I was rejected from most places. Um, I got accepted to a couple of master's degree programs and um, I went to um, Columbia University in part because they offered me the best deal. Um, they, they admitted me into their PhD and um, and and they did it with funding and so my choice in a sense was kind of made for me um, and I went to New York um, I began my graduate studies in fall of 1999 and no that is not a typo it took me 10 years to finish as it did many um, many of my my colleagues um, it was it was it was intense intense 10 years coursework um, language study, field work, writing a dissertation, which is like a book length manuscript of one's research that we carry out in the field. And also I got married um, and had a baby um, and lots going on, right? Very intense 10 years. So I'm just gonna highlight a, a, a few things about um, my work in graduate school. Um, just so you know, this is a picture of part of Columbia's campus on the right, this building is, um, is the library, um, my beloved place where I spent lots and lots of time. So um, during my coursework at Columbia, so we do three years of coursework in, in, uh, for a PhD in anthropology. Um, so this before I started field work, um, one of the things that I learned how to do in my classes was analyze more carefully um, the role of the state in people's lives and state governments. Um, and also the importance of telling stories to chip away at and eventually dismantle systems of power and potentially create something new. Um, I read a lot of theoretical work in anthropology, philosophy, and literary theory. And I became intrigued with um, the theoretical implications of something that's called haunting, 
um, this idea, I said, it sounds kind of out there, but this idea of taking ghosts seriously, and I'll talk about that more in a second. Um, probably because in part because of my own family history of European fascism and how it shaped our family, I became really fascinated with and horrified uh, by Spain's history of fascism. There was an exceptionally brutal civil war in the late 1930s um, that led directly to a fascist military dictatorship that last for, lasted for decades. It started in 1939 and, um, and went until 1975. And I wanted to know how that experience of dictatorship and the normalization of oppression and, um, and brutal violence still made itself felt in the presence. In other words, how it haunted the presence. And here I have just a quote from actually a sociologist who wrote a book called Ghostly Matters. And she, it was a really important book for me when I was in graduate school. So she writes, haunting and the appearance of specters or ghosts is one way we are notified um, that what's been concealed is very much alive and present. Haunting is a frightening experience. It always registers the harm inflicted or the loss sustained by social violence done in the past or in the present. And to me, this seemed really important in the context of Spain, um, where when Spain transitioned to be a democracy after the dictatorship in 1975, they passed a, a kind of law um, that was often, it's often referred to as the Pact of Oblivion saying we shouldn't look at the past. We shouldn't think about that violence that took place for decades and decades. Let's just forget about it and move on and look forward to this beautiful, bright new future. And when you don't look at the past, it comes back to haunt you. Um, I mean, in a sense, this is what Spain is seeing as a society. And this is what I became um, interested in. Um, I also wanna say a little bit about writing um, because writing a dissertation is such an intense process and um, writing a, a, a dissertation, being pregnant and then having a newborn is an intense process too. So I want to say something about this because I, I learned how to do things in a different way when I was um, writing my dissertation. So I first started writing my dissertation. Um, I got pregnant at, toward the end of my field work. Um, and I started writing my first dissertation and I vividly remember um, like late in pregnancy, sitting at the computer and feeling my daughter like stretch and feeling her hit up against my ribs and feeling her head against my pelvic bone. And that pressure, that physical pressure, I felt it as like, okay, you need to write because this, this, this person is coming and you're not gonna be able to do that later on. And I used to be a very, I used to be a perfectionist with writing um, and I learned how to drop perfectionism. I learned how to write just to get something on the page. I learned how to embrace what sometimes writers call that shitty first draft, just getting something out there. And um, when I continued to write my dissertation and later on teaching at the same time, um, a friend of mine who might actually be here today, um, she taught me this trick. She said, okay, put this app on your phone and um, it'll time you. You write in 45 minute increments, then you rest for 15. And that's why I wrote my 350 page dissertation. I wrote it 45 minutes at a time. And now when I'm writing, cause I'm even more pressed for time, sometimes I write articles 15 minutes at a time with like a five minute rest. And if I get in just 15 minutes in one day, like, cool. So I've kind of learned how to do that. Whereas before I was just like, no, I must write for three hours or it's not worth doing anything at all. So that was really lots of learning experiences um, for me when it came to writing. Um, so I just wanna give you guys a heads up on the next, slide, I'm going to show um, uh, a picture that contains images of, um, of skeletonized human remains. So I just want to give you guys a heads up before I go to the next slide. Um, so 
um, actually, oh, nope, sorry, it's two slides from now, so I give you more time for that heads up. So going back to um, that history in Spanish, um, in Spanish fascism um, and haunting, it colored my fieldwork, which I ended up doing on that pilgrimage route. Um, and I just wanted to show you a couple pictures of what ethnographic, just really briefly what ethnographic fieldwork looks like based on something in um, anthropology we call participant observation, which one anthropologist has called like, quote unquote, deep hanging out, which is always a description I really liked. It's, it's hanging out because that's what you're doing. You do a lot of hanging out, but it's deep because you step back and you reflect on it and you write about it, which is not usually what we do when we're just hanging out. So in Santiago, I hung out with people I met who could teach me more about my interest in Spanish fascism and how it haunted the present. I spent time in libraries and archives, and then I walked the pilgrimage and I spent hours with other pilgrims. We walked and talked and ate together. And my dissertation ended up being split between a historical analysis of the pilgrimage during the dictatorship and an ethnographic study of the pilgrimage in the present. So I just wanna show you, this is me on the pilgrimage, doing it, participant observation. Behind me is a house in a very rural part of Spain, in Northern Spain, kind of in ruins, but you can tell it was once a house of nobility because it has that stone crest on the side. This was just, like, and then the middle picture here, um, just a, a roadside shrine that I thought was so um, cool um, with a little picture of uh, a little statue of the Virgin Mary in there. And then, thank you, Wendy and Caitlin, this actually inspired me to go into my garage and dig out my fieldwork journals from when I did my fieldwork. And I took a picture of just a page and it's funny here because I'm looking at the journal and I would be so tired at the end of the day from all this walking that you can tell that I stopped mid sentence in one of my like field work because I would just like fall asleep sometimes on top of my notebook. And I and then I was just like jotting down things. Um, I didn't carry a computer with me on my pilgrimage because it would be too heavy. So I was jotting down things. And then when I went back to Santiago and finished, I would go and write up on a computer, these narratives, right, of, of what I had, um, what I'd written up. All right, now I'm gonna show you that, um, that photograph of remains and talk a little bit about what I've done post, um, after my PhD in the past, things I've been working on for the past 10 years or so. Um, so I became interested in um, the exhumation of mass graves that has been going on in Spain since about the year 2000. And these mass graves date from the um, late 30s, from the time of the Civil War and the early days of the Franco dictatorship, um, when people who are on the wrong side of the war were just taken out and tortured and shot, and their bodies were dumped in graves. And there are these graves everywhere in Spain. If you look at um, a map of Spain with where the locations are of these mass graves, the map is covered. And a lot of them have been exhumed now and people put, um, and bodies given a dignified burial, but um, in, in a lot of cases they, um, they haven't yet. And so one, one article that um, I published a few years ago um, was on the search for um, the body of the poet and pay, um, playwright Federico Garcia um, Lorca, who some of you may have heard of. He was assassinated during the early days of the Civil War um, in 1936, and his body was dumped in a mass grave. And one of the things that um, I was interested in with this particular search, which got a lot of um, coverage in the Spanish press was that the search for his body ended in failure. They never found it. And I was interested in this questions of like, what happens when we don't know? Um, what happens then? What happens when there is no, um, no process of identification, not even no promise of closure, nothing like that. And to try to get wrap my head around this, um, I started reading a lot of Lorca himself. And he wrote so beautifully about the forms of art that emerge out of 
pain and out of disappearance and death and destruction. And I thought he has, he himself has something to say about this. Um, and so when I wrote about the failed search for his body, I tried to weave together like his, his own words with my observation and analysis. So one of my favorite essays of his is called Play and Theory of the Duende. And it's just, it's actually an essay about, well, duende is what he refers to. It's the Spanish word for the forms of art that come, that precisely come out of pain. And I just wanted to read out one of these excerpts here. Um, so he says, Spain is moved by the duende, for it is a country of ancient music and dance where the duende squeezes the lemons of death, a country of death open to death. Everywhere else, death is an end. Death comes and they draw the curtains, not in Spain. In Spain, they open them. A dead man in Spain is more alive as a dead man um, than any place else in the world. And to me, especially that last line was so haunting that he wrote that three years before his own um, assassination. Um, and these bodies do, I think, um, you know, that, that are exhumed, they tell us their, their stories. Um, so more, most recently, and this is what I'm currently working on, um, have not more, more uh, journal excerpts for, for you guys to, to look at. Um, so I'm starting a work on a project that resonates um, a bit with the Lorca one in the, just in the sense that it's still about um, violence during the, the war and the, the dictatorship and how that violence haunts the present moment and what people do with that and their attempts to create something new out of that, that pain. Um, so, this current project is about two sisters, um, Coralia and Marusha Fandino um, Ricard, and they're pictured here. Um, their family was involved in anarchist politics at the beginning of the Spanish Civil War. And when the war started, the men in the family went into hiding and the women in the family, these sisters, they were faced interrogation um, by fascist officials torture, uh, public humiliation, like head shaving. Um, and there are stories not confirmed, but people, there are rumors that they may have been um, raped as part of the torture. And when this especially brutal period of the war was over with, um, and they began to be more left alone, they began to dress up in really colorful clothes and cover their faces with really thick layers of makeup. And they would take daily walks around Santiago and they would catcall men. And this might just seem to us to be kind of funny, kind of eccentric, but this behavior was absolutely like unheard of at this point in the incredibly repressive, incredibly conservative early days of the dictatorship. Women were not supposed to put themselves out there, but especially women who came from like the quote unquote wrong families. Um, but this is what they did for decades. Every day at two o'clock, they would go for their walk and in their colorful get up and they would cat call men. And for years they were remembered as um, kind of colorful fixtures of the, of the city. Um, uh, they're also remembered as just and kind of dismissed as crazy, but as in the last 10 years or so, Galician women, politicians, artists, historians, bookstore owners, feminists, um, they begin to memorialize these women and consider their apparent insanity as a form of resistance and see their use of color and makeup as a particularly feminine form of resistance. And so they pay homage to these sisters and they write stories and plays about them and they see them as an inspiration to fight new forms of authoritarianism in the present, which I think is really important. And so these are pictures of them. This is a, a flyer that was posted on in the middle uh, in social media it's to like calling for a, like a day of, of commemoration. And then these are field notes from um, a couple of years ago when I first attended one of these kind of um, um, commemoration um, ceremonies in Santiago. And so the last thing I'm, I wanted to say is just, again, to come back to um, ideas around writing and what I'm kind of thinking about and what drives me when I write about um, 
these women and other people, um, people who have been inspired by them. And one of my primary concerns, in addition to just like writing the most rigorously truthful and representation of this as possible, is, is it's kind of, it's, a, it's ethical. So one of these questions that comes to my mind is how can I best tell stories that fundamentally belong to other people? And how can I write in a way that does justice to these people's lives and, these, and, and their deaths? And one way that we can do this, one way that I do this in anthropology, it's a pretty well-known technique um, to kind of almost displace my own vo voice and my own authority. So it's not like I know how to t best tell the, this story because I really want their story to come through, not me. Um, it's called polyvocality. And it refers to this idea of multiple voices in a, in a text. So quoting people as much as possible, telling people stories in their own words as much as possible. And then other things I try to do, um, I try to write with as much precision as possible. So like observing and reading and listening as carefully as I can, choosing my words very carefully when I'm writing. Um, I try to pay attention to the sound of language. This goes back to my old interest in poetry too, um, to like fine tune a turn of phrase so that it resonates with the reader so that the reader doesn't just have an intellectual connection to the story, but also a visceral, like a bodily connection to the story. And I think that when we write ethnography, this is part of what we're doing is that we're kind of, we're charged with taking care of the stories of other people um, to interpret them and analyze them and relate them to a wider audience. And it's this really delicate task. And um, I think it's one of the most important things that we can do as writers. So I'm gonna leave it there. Um, I know people have, um, questions. I'm seeing like in the chat that there's, there's comments that I haven't gotten a chance to, um, to look at yet. So um, maybe we can address some of those. We have a question from a student, Alba Serrano, uh, asking if they still have these exhumations in Spain. I'm assuming Alba means the exhumations of the, the mass graves. Yeah, so it's been this ongoing process. The first um, exhumation started to be carried out only in the year 2000. So if we think about it, that's like 25 years after, um, after um, the dictatorship ended. The dictatorship ended when the dictator died, basically. Uh, but people were so afraid that to open these graves would be like opening up the wounds of the past and that it might even start um, another civil war. And right-wing politicians kind of almost held that over people's heads. You don't wanna go there, right? And that's why there is this long delay. So yeah, the exhumations only started in the year 2000 and yes, they are still very much going um, on today. Thank you, Jenny. Um... Also, uh, we queried students about questions they had for you, and several were interested in your study of witchcraft and magic. And uh, one also wanted to know about um, whether religion and magic have similar roots. Can you speak to that? I can try. Um, so, yeah, I mean, one of the things, um, one, one of the things that we, that we talk about, so I teach a class called um, Anthropology of um, Magic, Witchcraft and Religion. And I would say that, yeah, there's, there's these, these three topics um, aren't as distinct as we might usually think. Often kind of religious practices might contain an uh, element of what in anthropology we might call, um, call magic and I can give you just like a brief example of this from from my field work. We do think that they have um, they have their origins in the same in the same um, in the same place. Although it's really hard to like pinpoint the origins of of religion, religious practices, magical practices um, in a like at a particular moment of time because they um, religion has most likely been around 
as long as um, as humanity has has been around is part and parcel of who we are as as um, as human beings. But just to give you an example, um, sometimes when people think about religion, they think, okay, organized religion is over here. Magical practices where maybe an individual is carrying out a particular kind of ritual in order to bring about a particular outcome, that this is something um, that this is something separate. Um, so we can see lots of examples when they come together. So like one story, um, kind of a story of folk Catholicism um, from Galicia, where I did my field work, is that um, it's kind of a horror story even told to children. Like you don't wanna go into the mountains at night because, and, you, and if you look at the mountains at night, you might see lights sparkling up there. And you don't wanna be there because you might come across something that's called the Santa Campania, which is kind of translates loosely as the sacred company. It's like, it's kind of related to the Catholic idea of like souls in purgatory who are wandering around. But instead of wandering around in purgatory, they're wandering around in the mountains. And my husband, for example, my husband's from Spain, his great grandmother told him that if you, you know, God forbid, but if you're ever in the mountains that night and you come across this, the Santa Campania, it's like a line of souls, right? And the first person in that line is carrying a cross. You don't want to come across them because the person will hand in the first, in the front of the line will hand you their cross and then you will be trapped in purgatory and you will have to wander around for all of eternity. So this is a very Catholic idea, but the great grandmother um, told him that if you, if you are in the mountains and you come across this, what you wanna do is basically what we would consider, it's not, it's not Catholic ritual, it's a magical ritual. And that's find a stick and draw a sacred circle around yourself on the, um, on the ground. And that will keep these, these souls in purgatory that will keep them away from you. Um, magic is a form of, I think, religious ritual where a person takes it upon themselves, where a person has like this kind of, is understands themselves to have a kind of internal, um, internal power to transform reality in some kind of way. And we see this um, in religious traditions and folklore all over the place. So yeah, I would say that religion and magic, the boundaries blur between them and they do have similar um, roots and origins. Other questions? Uh, we had a, a question over who did the mass murders uh, during Franco's regime. Um, do you, can you answer that? Yeah. Um, so often they were uh, uh, people in, in the police force, um, people in the, the, the military. Um, there were a lot of um, informers in, in villages and in cities. So, and sometimes that people didn't even, weren't even telling the truth. Maybe there was this long standing grudge, but they'd be like, call, go over to the police station and say, hey, you know, my neighbor, um, he was on the other side in the, in the, in the civil war. Um, and you know, I don't really trust the things he's he's doing now. And they and the police and these officials, um, they would instead of like taking someone out and like putting them on. I mean, political dissidents of any sort was illegal, not tolerated, right? But even instead of like taking people to trial, they would just take people out and um, and kill them. So this was done with um, the authorization of the state. So I think someone answered in the chat that, um, yeah, that uh, Franco, I mean, it wasn't Franco personally, but we can, uh, it was done with, um, with Franco's uh, blessing and his, and his authorization. So th that's why we call these extrajudicial killings, because they were done without, um, without a trial. Um, but people in this part of, um, in this part of Spanish history, they talk about like the terror of the state because the state kept kept people in line by inflicting fear and terror in this um, on the on the population. Thank you. Um, looks like Ryan has his hand up. Ryan, would you like to speak? Okay, yes, thank you. <laughs> um, so I just have a first thanks, Jen, for, for sharing these thoughts. Uh, it, was, it was amazing. Um, I have a question for you about handling field work. Um, I'm an archaeologist, right? And so I'm always working in places that are abandoned and in ruin. 
And that kind of hangs over everything we do. And so my question for you is, you know, how did you handle research, you know, your dissertation research that in part focused on trauma, grief, anguish, um, you know, you know, how did you retain and, and, and asking people to center on those experiences? How did you retain your well-being in, in that? You know, I think this is why, in part, um, I, 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 you know, when I when I was relating part of this and like saying that I have this, you know, personal history that's um, wrapped up with um, with European fascism, I think that part of my ability, you know, uh, since my own personal history is outside of this, that makes it easier. I never, for example, wanted to do um, field work on anything that had to do with like. Uh, with my own personal history, right? Like Germany or any of that. Um, it's easier when you're listening to um, to other people. The, the other thing that happens is, you know, when a lot of people talk to me about this stuff in Spain, they're, they're a new generation, right? So they were born like um, maybe around the time like with people who are born, people who are my age, um, who are a lot of the people I initially um, met in Spain, they were born at the end of the dictatorship. They have heard these stories from their um, their parents and, and grandparents. Um, and when they tell these stories, they're less sad than they are um, angry about the, uh, the lack of, of justice um, going on. And I think that um, in part, um, you know, one gets kind of inspired by the desire of people um, to create something different and new and a Spain that isn't so haunted anymore, a Spain that can actually look at its past kind of fully and acknowledge what happened. So that's part of it, right? Just taking my cue from the people um, I, um, I, I speak to, and I think that also their own remove from a lot of stories that they, that they tell. Of course, I've talked to older people too, but um, I think is also um, helpful. And I think that I just, um, one of the things I feel so strongly about is just like the, um, how these stories just, they're demanding to be told and, um, and they, and they should be known in a, a like a wider audience. Like I knew nothing about the Spanish Civil War and how it was understood as a prelude to World War II until I was in until I was in graduate school. And um, and I think a lot of people don't know these things. And part of it is just like this, I think this drive that I have is just like, you know, people have to know this. And I think that 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 helps then situate you know, the, um, the stories of pain and, and trauma is just like, um, this, this stuff needs to, this needs to be known. It used to be, I think we're not under that impression anymore, hopefully. It used to be that people thought, oh, you can leave that stuff in the past because, you know, fascism, fascism authoritarianism, that's like very 20th century, that's over and dead, right? That's not going to come back. But, um, you know, even just leaving leaving the United States aside, we can see like the reemergence of fascist and author authoritarian um, governments and their actions, right, um, in Europe today and other places in the world. And so this history is more important than ever. So I think that just like, you know, um, that I think, again, just that drive um, about like justice and working with people who want that, I think that helps me compartmentalize um, the 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 aspect of field work that's difficult right of of dealing with this stuff thank you mm -hmm. of course thanks um i wanted to if we have do we have a little time um i wanted to just comment on something um saying so like um lance parker in the chat um yeah you know it's interesting um I think, um, I don't know the exact statistics as, as they exist now, um, today, 2022, but uh, Lance is uh, citing um, uh, numbers from 2006 saying that um, a, third of, um, a third of Spaniards um, still support 
um, Franco um, or or I, I'm not sure exactly what that means if they support the Falange or if they support, you know, um, just like or have, you know, thought that the dictatorship was is, um, um, you know, good. Um, and it's true, you know, the dictatorship um, changed over time. And with this, I'm not going to justify, I don't want to justify anything about the dictatorship, but it softened um, over, over time. They weren't, for example, that brutality of killing people like en masse, um, that didn't, um, that didn't go past um, the early years of the, of the 1940s. And at a certain point, you know, um, the thing about authoritarian governments and dictatorships is that if you keep your head down and um, your mouth shut and you don't want to rock the boat, um, people felt people talk about how they felt sometimes very, um, very safe, like um, during the dictatorship. Um, maybe because there were such severe punishments, right? So, so I've talked to people who have said, you know, there was a lot of stability and security and look at this, you know, scary world that we're living in today. Maybe things were better back then. And we always have to ask when, when we raise that question, better for whom? And also, you know, in terms of what's, what's, the, what's the payoff? What's the pay, payoff of living under a dictatorship? And what's the payoff in um, living in, in uh, different forms of society? But you're right. Um, and I want to acknowledge that is there is plenty of nostalgia in Spain um, for the, the Franco um, dictatorship. Thank you. We had a question earlier from a student, Talon Tudor, asking about the best major to become an ethnographer. Well, I'm a little biased. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, th I think of I think of you know uh, ethnography as central to culture to cultural an um, anthropology um, and and what we and, and and what we do and how we learn um, about um, about culture. So I guess that's kind of a predictable um, <laughs> answer. Um, but of course, there are other disciplines that um, where people do ethnographic work too. I was at the talk on on Monday um, that um, by a sociologist and in sociology too, um, there's a lot of um, people who do um, ethnographic uh, work. So um, social sciences in general, Anthropology would be my favorite, but sociology too. Thank you. Um, we have time for maybe one more question if someone has one, either in the chat or jump in. We do have a question. Um, uh, about the mass murders, um, I, I posted a link um, that I, I assume that the bodies were often everyday people, like you said, whose neighbors told on them or were viewed for one reason or another to not fit in or have the wrong point of view. Yeah, like, um, like Lorca himself, um, he was... Um, he he was he was uh, he was assassinated we don't know we don't know by whom exactly but um we know that he was a target he was very famous even though he was only in his 30s um when he was killed he had already reached a particular um level of fame for his poetry and his plays in spain and it was even though um you know in the 1930s it wasn't it, it wasn't you know as socially acceptable to be um to be out of the closet, I think it was pretty much public knowledge that he was gay. Um, he was anti-fascist. He was anti, um, you know, the war, and he was a he was a prime target. I think he was killed. Um, and he, but you could say he was a he was kind of a celebrity, so not ordinary in that way. But he wasn't a soldier, right? He wasn't fighting in the war. Um, but um, to try to demoralize people, he was attacked for all those reasons for his political persuasions for the fact that he was gay, um, that fact that he was outspoken and he was killed um, 
only about a month or so after the war began. Um, but yeah, no, a lot of ordinary, very ordinary um, people. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Well, thank you, Jenny, for taking the time to visit and talk with us. It was so amazing to hear the story of your work. And thank you for your honesty, your vulnerability, um, the details of how you did this, the highs and the lows. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Really, really value that. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for having me and giving me this forum. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna, if, if, if I can, just really quickly, um, if, can people see the chat or can only I see the chat? I was just gonna say um, that uh, if anyone is interested in, um, in e emailing me, if you have any more questions about anthropology or ethnography or Spain, because um, I love talking about this stuff, um, my email address is J-S-I-M-E and then at um, sdccd.edu, so. Great. Well, hey, Jennifer, what are you teaching in the fall for the students that are here? I am teaching, um, I always teach uh, Intro to Cultural, um, Magic, Witchcraft, and Religion, which is my baby and I love, mm -hmm. and then um, Anthropology of Gender and Sexuality. That's what I'll be teaching. So, Excellent. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you again for coming. Thank Everyone, you. remember, we also have an anthropologist talking Monday, 10 a.m., Noel Lopez from the National Park Service. Happy Friday, everyone. Thanks for coming. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.